webinar is part of Series Spring 2020 webinar series. Listed here are the next three offerings. In February, we will cover the latest levels of preservation, a tiered set of recommendations on how organizations can begin or enhance their digital preservation activities. In March, we will look at a project that lays out a roadmap for preserving and making accessible congressional correspondence, a roadmap that we hope will be helpful for other agencies and types of correspondence. In April, we have a webinar on creating sustainable ways to document our own policies, practices, and workflows to make sure that all that hard work doesn't go to waste. Stay tuned to COSA's website, listservs, and monthly news briefs for news on the rest of our spring webinars. I would also like to call your attention to some online educational resources that the Siri Education and Programming Subcommittee has developed. Our first is called Managing Digital Content Over Time, and it is a series of videos that discuss the core activities associated with digital preservation. The second is a recording which asks and answers some of the most frequently asked questions on BitRot, the silent corruption of electronic records. We hope these recordings will be a useful resource, especially for those new to digital preservation. Today's webinar will also be linked from the COSA site for future reference. And now that we got through all of the announcements, let's turn to today's webinar. Please note that we will hold all questions until the end, but please enter any questions you have into the chat box at the right of your screen at any time during the presentation. I'm happy to introduce today's speakers who all join us from the South Carolina Department of Archives and History. Jessica Hills is the Electronic Records Analyst. She received her MA in History with an advanced certificate in archival studies from Auburn in 2012, and she has worked for the agency since December 2014. Catherine Slover is the Electronic Records Processing Archivist. She graduated from Middle Tennessee State University in 2016 with an MA in Public History with a concentration in archival management, and she has been at the agency since April 2018. Morgan Jones King is the Electronic Records Archivist. She received her MS in Library Science with a concentration in Archives and Records Management from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 2014, and she has worked for the agency since June 2014. She has been a certified archivist since 2018. And with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Morgan. Thank you, Catherine. Let's see. All right, so today we're going to be discussing our uh, email workflow here at the South Carolina Department of Archives and History. Um, I will preface this by saying we are by no means experts. We're still learning, but this is the workflow that we have arrived at after some lessons learned. Um, and so we're just going to cover a few things from creator to access. We're going to go through um, the stages of records management, um, the receipt and the export of emails, how we process them, how we bring them into our digital preservation system and then actively preserve them, and then how we make them accessible. Um, so we'll try to cover all of the highlights in those areas. Um, we'll probably spend the most time in export and processing. Um, and like Catherine said, we're very happy to answer questions and Maybe we'll even learn something from a few of the people here today. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jessica so she can start us off on the records management portion. Thank you, Morgan. How long do I have to keep my email? I have been at the archives since December 2014, and I still get this question at least once a month. I have already received it once this year and we're only 14 days in. But that's all right, it's okay, it's down from once a day, which is how often I got that question when I started. I have found that the only way to prevent this question is really to answer it as 
often as possible. A big part of my job is to go out and conduct training sessions for state agencies and local government entities. In every single training session, I still spend at least five minutes explaining that email is not simply one record series. There is no firm, you keep your emails for X number of years and then you delete them. I have to explain that email is a platform which usually contains multiple record series, each with a different retention period. Even though, yes, the majority of records sent via email are considered correspondence. But most people do not consider the number of emails they send that are better categorized as something else. Um, as I said, yeah, the majority of emails will be consider considered correspondence. For our purposes in South Carolina, correspondence is covered under one of two general retention schedules and is either executive level or non-executive level. Non-executive level correspondence only has to be kept as long as it is being referred to, but executive level correspondence is permanent and has to be transferred to the archive. There will be more on that later. But when I say some non-records or some records are better categorized as something else, something else like what? Um, other common record types in email are agendas, meeting minutes, policy files and directives, and documents relating to specific projects. Some of those types of records are covered by different retention periods because they are covered by other retention schedules. More often, though, the things in email, there are a lot of non-records to go with all those records because there is no way that the official version of meeting minutes or policy directives is sitting in someone's email inbox. The emailed version is going to be considered a, a convenience copy. I tell agencies that they should keep a copy of the email only if it offers any further information on the attachment that is those meeting minutes. Otherwise, they only need a record of the fact that the attachment was emailed and to whom and when but they don't necessarily need to keep the email itself. Other non-records commonly in email um, are spam, um, internal memos, memos that say things like it is so-and-so's birthday and there's cake in the break room, um, list serves if the recipient does not respond to the email, uh, vendor emails, obviously if the email is unsolicited and does not result in any follow-up, and personal emails. I cannot believe that I still have to tell people that they should not be using their work email for personal emails, but those are, you would not believe how common that last one still is. I like to tell agencies what types of emails are not considered records because I believe it helps them begin to distinguish between different content. And we do allow agencies to weed out the non-records before they transfer the records to us which brings us to the transfer process. This is how, prior to 2015, the archives could not officially accept electronic records. That is not to say we did not receive any. People used to put CDs and other removable media in boxes with their paper transfers. I don't know if they hoped we wouldn't notice or what, but they would send them anyway. Now, however, we actively encourage agencies to transfer electronic records, especially emails. The earliest receipt of emails looked like this, which is on your screen. It was an email that was received by the original recipient, then printed out, and then re-scanned. I cropped it because it's just an example, but you can see that at one point the full email was even put into a binder. That hole is from a three is, is from a three-hole punch. Uh, this email was included in a batch of scanned executive correspondence that we received from the South Carolina Department of Housing. In the last year, we have received the contents of several executive level email inboxes. Working with Catherine and Morgan, we developed the electronic records transmittal form, which is pictured on the right. I tried to make it as simple as possible to fill out. It is a fillable PDF and applies to all electronic records, not just email. The form asks, state agencies what type of records they are transferring, how big the transfer is. It also asks what format the records are in, if there is any personally identifiable information, and any other information we should be on the lookout for during the accession process. 
Emails are usually transmitted under the general schedule for administrative correspondence for the executive level, and hopefully they're in PST format. The form is filled out. The chosen records are moved onto some type of removable media, CD, USB key, external hard drive, et cetera. We do accept FTP transfers on a case-by-case -case basis, but that has to be worked out with me and usually Morgan and Catherine beforehand. The first email inbox we received using this form was from the South Carolina Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, I arranged the transfer of their former director, Marsha Adams. I arranged the transfer of her records with their records officer, who is my counterpart over there. And after I received the external media, I passed the form, the filled out form, and the removable media onto Catherine, which I will now do with the presentation as well. Catherine? Okay. So once I, once Jessica passes the external media off to me, I scan it for viruses and then pass it over to Morgan so she can export the PST file. So this is one case where our workflow is slightly different for emails than it is for most other electronic records um, because I have the technology on my computer to export the email. So Catherine will get it in, do her routine checks, and then hand it off to me. So we've got the emails, then what? Um, when we receive email accounts from agencies in a PST format, a personal storage table file, um, we can open them and browse them individually in our versions of Microsoft Outlook. However, if we were to make them accessible online in this format, it would, to a certain extent, eliminate searchability for our users and create another layer of technology for them to figure out. Um, we had this discussion very early on when we were talking about bringing emails in, and um, someone in the agency said, well, we just have to think about this from a researcher's point of view. We'd be asking them, um, to download something, whether it's at their home or in the research room, um, we'd be asking them to download a file, upload it into a viewing platform that they presumably have on their computer if it's Microsoft, but they may not. Um, so they, we'd be asking them to upload it in Outlook and then navigate through that. Um, this may make sense to some research, some more tech-savvy ones, but it's hardly intuitive and not very user-friendly. Moreover, it doesn't allow us to do any sort of meaningful processing. So we did some research, and we found a product that will both export email and their associated attachments from the PST file. So that is Total Outlook Converter Pro. Um, we do, like, we love it. It's very simple to use. Um, and the great thing about it from our perspective as well is that it's been okayed by IT, and it's a one-time purchase. It's not a subscription we have to renew. So when we use Total Outlook Converter Pro, we're able to preserve the hierarchical view of the email folder organization as it appears in Outlook, um, which is great. We're also able to assign metadata and establish a file naming convention for each record exported. We are able to export files to PDFs. Um, we could, if we chose, export them to other formats such as uh, Word documents, but we usually go with a PDF. We are also able to extract attachments and associate them in a variety of ways with the original email message. <clears throat> we can also convert them or leave them in their original file format. <clears throat> I apologize. Um, so we normally leave them in their original file format as a whole uh, when we export um, the attachments just because uh, we don't know what formats are in the email inbox or sent box. Um, so if they're all Word documents and we exported them and converted them to PDF, that's fine. But we don't know what all's in there and we don't know what we would lose by just clicking automatic um, conversion. Occasionally we go back and convert attachments directly from the exporter. All right. so. With this program, we're able to go from this view of many, many, many records in one executive level correspondence series to this view. And this view is essentially the breakdown of everything that was in that inbox into nice little neat file folders. And within that file folder, you'll see 
um, PDF, those are the emails, and then the folders are actually the attachments associated with those emails. So once I have conducted the export of the PST file and I've saved the records on our shared network, I let Catherine know so that she can begin processing the series. So when we first started dealing with email, we had to create processing policies specifically for PST files since we hadn't dealt with them before. Um, and we sort of did this by going through the first PST file step by step and making decisions as we went along to see what actually worked. Um, so the first PST file we worked with took, I think, about six months, and there was a lot of trial and error in this process. Um, but once we figured out the workflow we're going over now, our second PST file took only about two weeks to fully process. So there was a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, so now I'm going to go over a few of the lessons learned in this process. Um, so once the PST file has been converted, the first step is to scan the emails for viruses and BitCurator. Although we scan all electronic records for viruses before we put it on our network, we also need to scan individual emails and attachments once they're exported. Um, we learned this because Preservica automatically does a virus scan, and with the first PST file we processed, we got a notification that one of the attachments had a virus. And so we realized that the that BitCurator was only scanning the PST file and not individual emails, so now we scan everything twice just to make sure. Um, once the virus scan is complete, processing can begin. So one of the first issues we came across is that many of the emails and attachment names were too long to open or to move once they had been converted. Um, and at first we used the program bulk rename utility to shorten the file name length as needed, but Morgan figured out how to export the emails and attachments under a certain character length so we wouldn't have to remove them after the fact, which helped take that extra step out of the processing. Right, I think we ended up landing on 50 characters or 90 characters for, um, for the file length. A lot of it depends on um, if they're going to be attachments as well. Um, the second lesson we learned is that um, Total Outlook Converter Pro saved email attachments by creating file folders named for the emails with the attachment. Um, we figured out how to use bulk rename utility to extract them and rename them so we could interfile them with the PDF email messages. So you can see how this looks in the image on the screen. Um, so it's got, you know, a PDF with that number and date identifier and then, you know, you see an Excel uh, document and a PowerPoint below it that are the corresponding attachments. So this is done for both accessibility purposes for users and for system requirements for Preservica. And once the attachment files have been removed from their folders, they're much easier to process. Um, the other thing that we learned in this process is that a lot of times um, email uh, attachments and even subject names have some odd symbols in them. And so um, when we first tried to, we went through our whole processing workflow and when we first tried to uh, ingest, or when Morgan first tried to ingest the first batch of emails into Preservica, she kept getting weird errors. And so now we go through um, at the end of our processing to remove certain symbols. Um, and even now it's still trial and error um, if it's something we haven't come across before. So the next step in processing is to inspect the file structure and decide on an arrangement. For the most part, files are arranged by mailbox folder, like inbox, sent mail, um, spam, et cetera. But the goal is to try to preserve the hierarchy as much as possible. However, for access purposes, some arrangement may need to be imposed. For example, with the clutter or contacts mailboxes, we might have a couple hundred files, so we're able to leave them as is most times. But for the inbox and sent mailboxes, which could have anywhere up to 20,000 files in them from several different years, we decided to separate them further for accessibility into folders by month when within each mailbox folder. 
Originally, we had tried to just separate them simply by the year within the mailbox folders, but for some mailboxes, there were still too many files, and so we needed to go down another level to make it more accessible. And this is something we assess at the beginning of processing, and it varies for each series and each mailbox within that. So we just sort of evaluate it um, as they come in and as we look at them. Another decision we had to make was what items need to be and could be weeded. Jessica already explained what agencies are allowed to weed before they transfer the records to us, but once they're in our control, we also do some weeding. We weed things like spam, listservs, and some of the content Jessica mentioned earlier, but we also had to make additional decisions regarding weeding. One of the first email sets we dealt with was Nikki ha Governor Nikki Haley's constituent email, and there was a lot of spam and bulk emails, so like the ones where it's a pre-made form and you sign your name to it and the public official just gets a copy from every person that signed it. Um, and you can see an example of this on the screen. So we had to decide how to deal with that. We wanted a record um, as an example of the type of things people were sending in like this, but we didn't need a, cop a thousand copies of the same email. So for emails like that, we decided to keep a 5% sample size and keep a note of how many of each email we weeded with the accessioning paperwork. And we also decided to weed undeliverable email notices if the original sent mail was included. So sometimes they sent out 100 emails and some were sent back, so if the original sent mail was there, we felt comfortable weeding the undeliverable notices. Um, next step is identifying and converting file formats. Although Preservica can do some file conversion before ingest, which Morgan will go over in a bit, we do convert some file formats beforehand if there's not a migration pathway. Um, so we use a program called Droid, which is Digital Record Object Identification, and it can scan a set of records to determine what file formats are contained within the file sets, and it also allows you to see where they're located. Um, so after using Droid, we use a variety of different programs to convert file formats for preservation and accessibility, and this has been um, a learning process because we've come across file formats that we weren't really sure what to do with, we didn't have a program that would open them or convert them, um, and so we've slowly been trying to figure that out, um, and we now have a master list of file formats um, and a program we can use to convert it for future, re future reference. Um, the next step is scanning records for personal identifiable information. Um, so with this large of a quantity of records, and especially considering that it's email, it's important to do a really thorough job. Um, first, we realized before we could scan for PII, we needed to OCR the materials that weren't currently text searchable. Um, so we use Abby Fine Reader for OCR projects. Originally, we tried to use Adobe Acrobat. Um, but with the quantity of files that we were OCRing, Acrobat was not sufficient. Again, trial and error. Um, so after we OCR the material, we use BitCurator to scan for things like social security numbers and credit card numbers. Um, and I also do a manual search for those things in case the PII was handwritten on a form. So BitCurator wouldn't pick up something like the handwriting, but my search would pick up the letters SSN or social security number or something like that. Um, Big Creator just scans for number sequences but not content, so I, I do the additional scan for content that may violate HIPAA, turning client privilege, um, or you know sensitive employee information that's not considered a public record. If we do find this information, we redact it um, using Abby Fine Reader and place an unredacted version in a um, deliverable unit that's not open to the public um, and place the redacted version in its place um, within the file structure. So once these steps are complete, I accession the data, create a record in our online catalog and summary guide, and then write um, series and deliverable unit metadata to be used in Preservica and passed along to Morgan, which I will do now as well. All right. Um, I just want to mention one of my favorite uh, 
things that we had that was like odd uh, file format wasn't actually an odd file format at all. It was like we, we had a lot of electronic records that came in. They were .lis and .tem, and finally we opened them in Word, and they were just lists and templates that had been saved with an extra period in the name, and it had thrown everything off. So there is a lot of trial and error in this process that we figured out, and sometimes the answer is just try opening it in Word when in doubt, and that'll work sometimes. All right, so um, here at um, South Carolina Archives, we use Preservica as a long-term preservation and access solution for permanent foreign digital records of state agencies, and um, we also use it for some of our digitized records. Um, the software package Preservica consists of preservation software, um, another piece for ingesting digital records and metadata, and a dedicated website where the records are made available. <clears throat> our first step when ingesting our final process email series into the South Carolina Electronic Records Archive <clears throat> is to create a submission information package for each deliverable unit. Um, and deliverable unit is um, Preservica's term. However, that's, if you're a Preservica user, you know that's changing in their latest update. That, that terminology is changing, um, and the way they operate is changing a little bit. Um, so, but essentially, for our purposes, it is an intellectual file unit. Um, so we add metadata at the series and at that file folder or deliverable unit level. Um, this metadata is written by Catherine unless there is item level metadata, which I would create. Um, we do that for things like scans of birth certificates. We've used it for um, plats that we've received from counties electronically, um, anything, or even social media. So anything that we might get in that would automatically have a certain amount of item level description with it or that would make it more desirable. Um, we have not yet done item level metadata for email, um, mostly because um, since it's PDF, it is um, text searchable within the website. So we just leave series level metadata. Um, at, we, do, we do EAD for series level metadata and then we do DAX for the deliverable unit. Um, or, EAD with DAX for series level metadata, sorry. <clears throat> so, um, when we create the submission information package, we add metadata, we designate whether it was born digital or digitized, we generate checksums, um, and then we add access restrictions if applicable. So that's like what Catherine's talking about. If we have materials that we have to redact, we will still upload the original digital versions of those so we have them in cold storage, so to speak, um, and then we just restrict them so that they're not available on the public um, facing side. And then we mark whether or not it's a preservation or a presentation copy. Once we've created our package, we run the ingest process. Um, and that is a fairly simple step now. Um, previously, um, when Catherine was talking about that first email account that we did that took about six months, um, <clears throat> this was the step where we usually discovered that something, something was going wrong, something had gone wrong, and we had to go back to the drawing board and assess what we needed to change in the processing workflow, um, whether or not it was an error because of a, a virus that was detected or an error because um, there were too many nested file folders in the package we were trying to upload. Um, or it couldn't process because of the symbols and file names. Um, and not just symbols you would have on your computer keyboard, things that you know you would see in probably mostly spam emails. You, know, you might see like a plane or a heart or even a smiley face. All of those would throw errors. Um, so this is the stage where if something has gone wrong or if we have missed something that will prevent it from being stored long term, this is the point where we'll pick it up. Um, but now it's much more simple now that, now that we've worked out a lot of those things. Uh, then once it's ingested into Preservica, we create further preservation access copies where applicable. Um, we use migration pathways to convert file formats. So if we have a Word document, an Excel document, uh, a WordPerfect document, we would use a migration pathway to convert that to a preservation file format. And then we would convert that again 
um, to a presentation format um, so that it would be usable. We have one in cold storage and one for use from the website, one for download. And then we would select which one of those we want to be accessed from the website. <clears throat> and we just do that because we want um, to make sure that what we're saving as our preservation format is so the lowest common denominator, the base file of format that we could do anything with in the future um, if there is an, an updated version or something that's no longer supported. So then once all that's done, we save copies of our submission information package um, and the associated metadata that we created onto our security server. And that is just um, for our benefit so that if something ever went wrong with Preservica and we had to um, rebuild it, we would have all of the packages to re-ingest into Preservica without having to build them from scratch again. Um, so we package those and put them on our security server and then, you know, we, we have a backup with um, another, we have, we have a backup with a university in another part of the state here in South Carolina um, so that we're protected from natural disasters as well as electronic records disasters. So we make them accessible after they go onto the website. Um, I send the link to Catherine so that she can add it to the catalog so that if someone is searching through SC ArcCat um, and they find a record through that, they'll have a link to the Electronic Records Archive. Um, we also have a list of records available in SARA um, on the home page, and that's organized by um, state records, private, local. And so we add the link to that list so that if they want to browse through that and see what we have available, it's there. And then we also add it to our ingest tracking list. And that is a, an Excel spreadsheet we keep for ourselves um, that denotes what we have as far as electronic records and um, what we have as far as legacy media in the stacks as well. So it tracks what we have that has gone into Preservica and what we have that needs to be preserved long term. So just today, for example, Kat and I were looking at that list and making a note of a couple five and a quarter inch floppy drives that we need to address before too much longer. So after the learning curve comes the rainbow. Some things that we've gotten out of this whole process, we have uh, revised, um, mostly, mostly on Catherine Mind, we've revised the electronic records manual. Um, so we've added things like how to do OCR, how to do redaction, how to um, how to organize certain things, also what symbols need to be removed, um, what programs need to be used for certain things. Um, we've refined our workflow between Jessica, Catherine, and myself um, so that it's much more efficient. Uh, we came up with the electronic records plan worksheet, uh, which we'll go over in just a minute. And then most importantly, we have accessible emails. All right, so this is the electronic records plan worksheet. Um, I sort of, I got an idea for this because I realized that a lot of archives have um, a processing plan worksheet. And I just sort of realized that Jessica and Catherine and I could really benefit from something like this because we each keep records of what we're doing, but there's not a start to finish record of what has happened um, with an electronic record that's come into the agency. We might each have a record of it, but there's not a record of the entire process. So uh, we collaborated on creating this um, based off of a couple of processing plan worksheets from archives around the country. Um, and so we started using it at the beginning of the 2020 fiscal year um, in South Carolina for anything that comes in electronic records. Um, we include information from records management so that it starts with Jessica um, such as the date of the transfer, um, everything from that to whether or not it came in on a carrier media and if we returned that to the agency, um, the original size of the transfer so that um, it's clear if we weeded stuff out that that'll be different. Uh, then in the date it goes to Catherine as the processing archivist, the accession number she assigns it, um, if anything was found when scanning for viruses, if we created a disk image, um, if there was PII. Um, we also include a section here for the export of the PST file in case there were errors um, or if any special decisions were made 
and if we change um, anything about the arrangement. And then you'll see there's a section for um, weeding and duplicate. And then this last section um, is really more related to preservation and preservica. Um, you know, we note whether or not OCR was run. Uh, we note about PII. We know what kind of file formats Droid um, found in there when Catherine ran it through. And so she'll note in that list under preservation needed um, if there was a file format that needs preservation, what its preservation file format is, and if she already did it before it came to me. So things that we can and should do before going into Preservica, she will do. Um, the rest of those will remain blank, and it'll be um, my job to finish them in Preservica, and I will note that on that preservation table. Um, on the last page, you just see the information we would check within Preservica, um, whether or not it's born digital, if we restricted it or not, um, and then what kind of checksums we ran, how many ingests, so how many deliverable units there were, what kind of work we did on it in Preservica after the fact, and then what date everything was finalized. And so here, um, I just like to show this because it's a good example of what emails look like now as available to the public. So this is the email of I'm the Deputy Chief of Staff for Budget, Budget Policy, Budget and Policy. This is Christian Soros, was under uh, Governor Nikki Haley. And so um, you'll see we have the inbox, the sent items, uh, the calendar, contacts, the lead items, draft, outbox, and sync issues. So we, uh, we weed out quite a lot, but we save quite a lot. We don't just do the inbox, and um, we also keep what they deleted. Um, and we also keep their drafts and their outbox, just because we don't know. I, I don't think it's malicious, but sometimes people delete things they shouldn't delete. I'm sure sometimes it is malicious, but we'll just go with it's not malicious. Um, but this is what it looks like now for people who want to contact us. And um, Christian Soar is such a good example because he was the one that um, it only took us two weeks to do his um, he's also a bad example because his was so easy. <laughs> it, was, it was maybe deceptively easy. We still don't take six months to do it, but a lot of them take a little bit longer than two weeks. But we actually put his up fairly quickly because we were receiving research requests for items in his collection or in his email. Um, so we were able to put it online and make it accessible fairly, fairly quickly, um, and that's what it looks like. So I know we're at the end of this, but I know we've already gotten a few questions. So um, this is our contact information um, with email address and phone numbers. I don't know about Jessica and Catherine, but I've been having some firewall issues. So if you email me and you don't get a hold of me, um, please feel free to call. But um, that is the end of our presentation, and we'll go ahead and take questions. Excellent. Thank you, speakers. Very good information. As you said, we already have some questions coming in. And Brent West asks, how do you handle non-email objects in the PST, such as calendar, contact, notes, and tasks? Right. So when we export the PST file, we actually do get exports of things like calendar and contact. I don't think we've had notes and tasks yet at all. Um, but we have gotten calendar and contact, and what gets spit out is essentially a PDF of the contact card information. Um, so we keep those and we save it as a record um, in the hierarchy. And then it's sort of the same for calendar. There's not going to be as much to the calendar PDF as there would be to an email, um, but it will be a record of what was on their calendar in PDF format. Does that answer the question? Catherine? All right, well, um, Catherine, can you hear me? All 
All right, we'll go ahead and uh, I see another question from Brent right under that. Um, do you have concerns about missing PII, especially if it is on the web? Um, yes, <laughs> we do have concerns about that. Um, Catherine, I, Catherine and I, but especially Catherine, we try to be very diligent about this, but that, that's why Catherine started doing the manual check. Yeah, I, I will say that the, the PII scan, both in Big Curator and my manual check, probably besides the OCR in the material, that takes the longest out of everything. Um, and we, I do it in smaller chunks to make sure that we don't miss anything, but I mean, obviously it's, it's a concern and we take it very seriously and try to be very diligent about not missing those things. Um, I will also say we're very, um, we're very concerned about making sure that our redaction tools are working. Um, so for a while we were just redacting in Adobe and we quickly realized that you could actually still search for what we were redacting and you could actually still copy and paste it. So that's part of why we switched to redaction in Abbey um, because we can actually delete the data underneath the redaction. Um, the other issue for, for PIA, you know, we, we haven't put this into practice yet, but we've discussed it having um, some sort of legal agreement when you come on to um, the website that you would acknowledge that if you find any sensitive information, um, is it that you're not supposed to share it or that you're supposed to let the archivist know. Um, there are versions of that for actual search room usage, but of course we can't um, always enforce that, but that's an idea we're playing around with. Uh, the next question I see is from Ethan Anderson. Uh, would it be possible to get a copy of the manual you developed? Um, sure, send us an email and we'll see what, um, some of it we can't send you because it's internal logins for our own usage, but we can certainly um, copy out public portions of it for you um, and see what's, uh, what's relevant to your needs. Um, Barbara Austin asks, what did you use to do the OCR? Uh, we use Abby Fine Reader, Abby Fine Reader 14. Um, it has an OCR um, component that we use quite, quite regularly. It's got a couple different functions to it that make it very user friendly. And then I see a question from Lizette. Um, Pelletier, can you say more about retention, um, i.e. exec and non-executive, and how state agency staff manage their email retention? Um, okay, our, we have what we call the general records retention schedules for state agencies. For the, uh, for the moment, they are fairly old. Um, they are from 2003. We are actually also currently in the process of revising the schedules but the schedules are still valid. Um, when we divide correspondence into executive level versus non-executive level, we usually tell state we have we have a lot of state agencies in South Carolina and they are radically different sizes. We have the state agencies that actually only have three or four people and then we obviously have the state agencies that have thousands of people. So a good rule of thumb for the larger state agencies is to consider the top three levels of management, the executive level. Those are gonna be your directors, your deputy directors, and your department heads. And anything in the executive level is going to be considered permanent and is what has to come to us. Now, like probably all of you as well, we are dealing with limited resources on our end. So we, our records management team is fairly small and we make ourselves available as much as possible to answer any questions they have and to do as many trainings as possible. We offer on-demand training to the state agencies at no charge to them um, so that we can teach them how to manage their email and as well as just records management in general. 
Um, but really, that's the most we can do. I can't micromanage the. I can't micromanage their handling of the non-executive level email. We have counterparts in each agency who are the, called. They're designated as records officers, and there are counterparts in the agencies, and they know. They know a lot about what their records management responsibilities are and how to get in touch with us, and they know that they're supposed to transfer the executive level correspondence to us. Captain, are there other questions that we're not seeing? I know sometimes some come in under Q&A. I think Catherine is having problems with her audio. Uh, okay. This is Becky. I don't see any other questions anywhere. All right. Well, we have time for a few more questions if anyone else. Ah, uh, okay. Here we go. Uh, Amanda Hartman, a uh, less technical question. How much pushback did you or do you receive from the governor's office when it comes to receiving executive level emails? Is it a fight to get emails? Um, with Nikki Haley, we, um, when she left office, we did not have pushback. We had very cooperative governor's office staff. Um, Right, Brian? Correct. Right. So, sorry, Brian Collars is also in the room with us, and he was um, more involved in that process. Um, with Nikki Haley, we did not get a lot of pushback for receiving their emails when she left off. They were extremely cooperative with us, um, but that was partially um, because we had written up a retention schedule for governor's correspondence um, specifically several years ago. Um, I would say it's actually more of a fight to get emails from other agencies. It, it can be, yes. Um, some, some agency directors don't want their emails made available publicly, but they are actually legally required to adhere to the South Carolina Public Records Act, which gives us the authority to maintain all of, to, to maintain authority over their records in general. Um, and so if they don't transfer them to us, they're not, still not allowed to get rid of them. They do legally have to maintain them. And so we try and point out how much time and effort and money and staff time and all sorts of stuff that's going to cost them to do so. And we also try and walk them through this workflow to show to kind of allay their fears and demonstrate that we are not out to play gotcha. We do not want to embarrass them. We are just trying to follow our mission statement as well as the law. Um, and so we will walk them, we are happy to walk them through this workflow and show all of the steps we take to ensure that we are not accidentally outing something that we're not supposed to be outing or embarrassing them in any way. And for the most part, that has helped. Yeah, I will say we also usually mention it. Um, Jessica and the other record management staff um, do an annual records training every year, and I usually get included at the end of it to talk about risk mitigation for electronic records. But emails always come up at that. Um, and so part of what we do now is we just show, um, you know, about the technologies we have and what we can do. And then we usually do a show and tell at the very end to show them what you know, it's like they come in once they've been processed and make it available. Um, because I think sometimes the fears, like Jessica said, they don't, they don't want it, the idea that something shouldn't be out there, it's out there. But then also I think it's just very overwhelming. They're going to have a larger responsibility um, for weeding or processing their own materials. Um, so if we can just show them the finished product of what an email um, set looks like on our website, it's usually very helpful. Um, okay, so James Hemphill says, are any particular email attachment file formats difficult to ingest or preserve? What were some of our weirder ones? We get access databases sometimes, and those we don't have a great way to deal with. Yeah, we, we convert those before. Yeah, we have to convert ingest. those before ingest. I think most, 
I think the more problematic ones are are formats that we don't have um, the software to open it, or we don't have a software to can convert it. Um, like we with um, some .eml files and on the software to convert those to PDFs, um, but we wanted them. Um, when we were first dealing with them, we weren't really sure what to do and what kind of format we wanted them to be in. Um, but I think the most often when we run into issues are things where we don't have something to open it. Like someone's using Microsoft Publisher and neither of our computers have Publisher. And so, right. um, or something that um, we've gotten some uh, Apple product um, documents. So it, all of these are really just they, you know, it's, they're difficult, like Catherine's saying, because we don't have something to open it or to convert it, but that usually leads us down a rabbit hole of trying to figure out if we can get something. Like, I don't know, eight times out of ten, we can figure out a solution. So it's just a, a momentary hurdle, so like for the, the Mac stuff. You know, we had a Mac computer upstairs, but that was too old, and then, uh, you know, we... But we ended up realizing we could actually just upload them into our iClouds and then re-download them as PDFs or Word documents. That solves the issue. Can anyone hear me now? We can, Catherine. Welcome oh, back. Hooray, I'm back. I give up on this headset. All right, so any more questions in the chat box? We have a couple more minutes before we have to send our speakers off. I had a question. I, I think Jessica mentioned something about uh, in some cases you don't have to keep the email itself as long as you're keeping a record of uh, that the email was sent. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, those are in specific cases when the attachment is something along the lines of like meeting minutes or agendas or policy directives. Something that is that is only the case where the attachment that is in the email is considered a convenience copy and the official version of that attachment is elsewhere, we will receive that attachment outside of the email inbox. And so we don't necessarily require them to keep the email that says, hey, Bob, these are the meeting minutes from yesterday's meeting of the board. We don't necessarily require them to keep that. It's not, a, it's not as important as other things that are sent via email, but they still have to maintain it elsewhere. That makes sense. And and you said they also keep track, like is do do you recommend they keep a log to say here's a list of all the people it was sent to? We do. Yes, we do. And when. All right, I don't see any more questions coming in through the QA or the chat. What kind of uh, schedule do you find for these transfers? Do people tend to do it at the, when they leave office, or do some people have it on a regular schedule? That's the work <laughs> progress. Yeah. Um, uh, officially, as the retention schedule reads now, it is supposed to be three years and then transferred to the archive. But if people are still referring back to those old emails, we don't require them to send them yet. So the three years is a minimum. Um, at this point, it really has been when the executives have left, I think, that we received the inboxes. Because then they're no longer referring to those emails and they don't need to keep them. And it's usually a lot easier to get IT or someone to dump it yes. at that point because no one feels attached. Yes. All right, I'm not. Seeing any other questions coming in, do you recommend that they delete it out of their system once it's been transferred, or is it okay for them to continue to have the email in their inbox while you have it archived? Uh, once we've once we've run the scan and it's in our system, we actually recommend that they get rid of it because the official version comes to us as soon as the transfer is complete, and so then what they have is a convenience copy. But if they have it and they're asked for it, they're still legally required to produce it. So it is just easier for them to not have it and to say, no, the archives has that and send them to send whoever is asking to us. 
That does seem wise. Okay, here is a question from Mary Johnson. You are back and forth with emails depending on which one has some software. Are you working at your everyday computers, or do you all have separate computers for electronic records? Uh, we work at our individual computers for most of the workflow. We do have a forensic computer, and that is the one that we use uh, for um, BitCurator and virus scans and all of our sort of forensic checks running for PII. But um, once it's been through the forensic computer, so, it, so normally it'll, if it comes in on FTP, that's different, but normally we get a flash drive. Um, so it comes in on that flash drive or an external hard drive. Um, Catherine would first take it to the forensic computer, um, then we'd unpack it, goes back to the forensic computer. Um, and then once it's been through that, then it goes on the shared network and we each use our individual computers. Okay, well. Seeing no further questions, I just want to thank our speakers again, Jessica, Catherine, and Morgan, for this wonderful presentation. And I also want to thank all our attendees for coming. Please complete the brief survey that will appear when you close the webinar, and watch for future COSA webinars to join us again.